Um, gosh, there's, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, Dimitri, you've done so many different things in your life. Uh, you've been drawing for a long time, you've been doing stand-up. Was this always like a little nugget in the back of your mind when you said, someday I, I want to do a movie? Yes, kind of. Um, when I was, I think my first goal as a, you know, for looking ahead to being a grown-up was to be a lawyer. And that was like a more of a plan. It was like, you know, seventh grade around then, I thought, all right, corporate law. That, that seemed like a, an impressive sounding job and stuff. So I had been drawing and stuff, but I never thought there would be any application for it. And my skills have not, they kind of plateaued around sixth, seventh grade. So that's what you see is kind of where I was at. So back then, I was one of the best in my class, maybe the best in the top of New Jersey. So that's not bragging, that's just the truth, you know. But now, it's, you know, it hasn't really evolved, but around, um, actually by the time I, I was maybe 22 or 23, when I started to have a, a showbiz dream of being a comedian, and then when I was 24, I started pursuing it, I started doing comedy. But it was only a couple, maybe two or three years after that, that I started to get the fantasy of maybe I could make a movie someday. But it was mostly just stand-up for me. And was it any particular movie, or did you think, when I do the movie, if I do the movie, I want something that is not exactly, I mean, this isn't exactly your life or your story, no. but there's a lot of similarities. Yes, this is autobiographical, and certainly in the emotional um, experience I've had and my family's had. But I'm not an only child. It was my father who I lost when I was 20, and he was 46. Um, thanks. <laughs> and, um, but that was a while ago. That was just 23 years ago. So, I, the original title for the movie was "The First Thing You Never Get Over," because the idea was to to tell a story about grief, but more when you're coming out of grief, maybe, or you're trying to come out of it. And I thought a father and son story would be interesting to have two guys trying to work through losing the same person and not realizing that they're doing kind of similar things and some of that, but. My first fantasies of making movies were more high concept, which I still, you know, hope I get to do someday with outer space, robots, like that, that kind of stuff. But uh, didn't have the budget for that here. So. <laughs> <laughs> just special effects in your own way. Was there any trepidation? Because this is, you know, especially just watching the end of the film again, and, and that it was footage of Dimitri's beautiful mom. That's hard. Like that, it's enough to take on. Like I'm gonna write a movie, and I'm gonna direct it, and I'm gonna star in it, and I'm gonna make it something so deep personal about death. Yeah. I feel like you're literally writing yourself the prescription for like, hey wound, here's here's a big old thing of salt. Definitely. Big trouble. Yeah, it's also it's interesting to take something difficult you've gone through and to turn it into something more difficult to go through. Which was not emotionally so much. I mean I, again I I'm not over losing my dad, but you know, yeah, life goes on. I'm okay, you know, my family's fine, more or less. But um yeah, but this was this was a whole different bag here. I, 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 I liked the control that I had so that I could tell the story the way I wanted to and I could fix it when I got into trouble, more or less. But um, yeah, the things I, I got to see my nose from angles I never thought I would. You know, things like that in the edit were just like, ooh, this is, this is rough. Can I, can I not release this, potentially? Um, so it's, it is funny. That's where your special effects budget is. That's exactly, yeah, exactly. Wow, is he Irish now? It's kind of different. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. You definitely, I think there's a there's a balance. There's definitely kind of you get what you ask for, even if you don't know what you're asking for when you when you do something like this. I'm always curious uh, with directors directing themselves in film, mm -hmm. especially when it's the first time endeavor. Can you take me to like a day on the set? How you directed yourself, how conscious you were of what you were doing at the time, or was it just I'm gonna try to be in it as much as I can at the moment and think about it afterwards? Definitely, that, this, I think this is a really interesting question to, to specify like that. So, as you can imagine, if you uh, direct a movie, and it's a small movie, you're gonna shoot a lot of pages every day. You're gonna have to shoot, this was a 20 day shoot, so I had to shoot, you could kind of divide it up and figure out how much you gotta shoot each day. And it ends up being a lot. And then, foolishly, I had a company move across the country in the middle of the movie, and even around, I had too many locations. I didn't know how I was talking out before I even started, but I was a big trouble. So that meant I had less time for each scene, and that's where it got difficult trying to direct myself. If you have a little bit more time, what you can do is you can stop and watch playback, 
Um, if you don't have time, then you have to choose. You know, you you can stop and, and check what you did and see if it's kind of working. Then you get fewer takes, or you can not stop, and then you get more chances to get the scene right. And so I I quickly realized I should not stop. I need to get more takes here. And then when I had someone like Kevin Klein in the scene with me, I sure as hell wasn't going to be like, hey, Kevin, can you just sit over there for a while so I can go look at myself? Uh, but thanks for doing the movie, but just let me go watch myself. So, so that I stopped doing pretty quickly. So let me think of an example. Um, well, what was hard was, was like, the, say, falling in the kitchen. I mean, it's just a fall, but I did want to have a chance that it could be funny. So I'm not a trained anything. I'm not a trained actor or a stunt person or whatever. So um, I had to figure out, you know, can I just make the fall look real enough? So we had, like put a pad down in the kitchen and then I just had a few shots at wiping out. And um, so I had to stop and look at them and be like, okay, I think, yeah, I think four, I, did, I picked number three. Or but that's really, it's very different for you because you're used to this world of stand up, you tell a joke, it lands, it bombs, but you read it, you have that immediate response, and then you can figure out what to do. Was, was this tough? I mean, I imagine it's pretty yeah. hard if you don't have that response. And on radio, the little we've talked about this before when we spoke, um, I mean, radio is interesting, right? Because you're in a bit of a vacuum, you're not getting immediate feedback. But it seems to me similar to stand up in as much as you say it. It's live, it's real time, off it goes. Now they'll play it again and you can't change it, but I'm guessing for you, right, it's kind of done. You've done it and then you go home, you're like, you don't have to worry about it. You know, I learned this and you can use this with your kids. There's a great expression about toothpaste, that, that talking is like toothpaste and once it comes out, you can't put it back in. Right. And that's exactly. what I think is true for you in stand-up. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's how stand-up is, but there's this at least illusion of control when you do stand up. You can feel the room, and if it's going wrong, you can try to save it or throw away a joke or something. But yeah, with this, it's it's locked and off it goes. And you know, sometimes I wish there was some sort of commentary you could do in real time if you're showing in the movie. I could just be on a microphone and be like, okay, everybody, hold on. Just before you judge the scene, you must understand we did not have a location until the day before. So this is actually really good given what I had to work with. And then be like, oh, this is this guy's great. Yeah, I love this movie. And you can't do that. It is funny, you, you get to make a movie, but Wonder Woman's over there and Parents of the Caribbean and this would be another Star Wars movie, whatever. So it's like, yes, this is also a movie, but there's such a range, you know what I mean? <laughs> All of these people are trying to get into Wonder Woman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they have to do this. Yeah. Um, was it helpful in that sense to have folks like Kevin Klein and Mary Steenberg mm -hmm. there to say, to, you know, because they, they have been to this radio yeah. before. Did you talk to them at all or kind of get their sense of, hey, are we on the right track here? A little bit. I, I was really lucky to get both of them. Um, I was first lucky to get Kevin. He responded to the script. We didn't know each other. That led to a lunch meeting. I flew to New York and met with him. It went well. Eventually, about a month or two later, he said, yes, I'll do it. Let's do it. Once Kevin comes on board, then it does become kind of a real movie. And then it's different. Then the dominoes kind of started to fall from there. And Mary came on board, which was great. And that was because I told Kevin, who do you want to work with? I'd love to, you know, how do I, what, what can I offer you here? Because you're not going to get, there's no money in this thing. It's a tiny budget. What am I going to do for his career? I mean, he's Kevin Klein already. I'm not going to change that. So, Kevin, I'm really going to help you out with my hundred million dollar movie. You know, it's going to be great. And so, I'm proud of the movie. Of course, I I, I like what we did. And I noticed my editors here. Um, that's Josh Salzberg right there. Josh, could you just stand up for a second? I just noticed that he's the editor. He did such great work. So, thanks for coming, Josh. Thanks for coming. This poor guy has seen this movie and my fucking face more than he ever. For the rest of his life, he doesn't have to ever see this again, so it's nice to remember. But yeah, when Kevin and Mary, they, they were they were not only generous to do the movie, they were so gracious when we were working. They really were very encouraging, and they made me feel like I was making something important, you know what I mean, or worth doing. But um, yeah, I can't remember any specific counsel about it. Like, you know, don't worry or anything. It was more like, they, they just seemed to trust me, and God, that's such a big deal. You know, to, to just trust people with your time and your talent and that kind of stuff, I feel like it's a big deal.